Good morning. It is Tuesday, June 29th, and we are here for the bi-weekly EVTOL Flight Test Council meeting. This is a special meeting this time around. We have uh, Dave Weber from the FAA is going to talk to us about EVTOL certification. So if you came in thinking it was going to be a regular meeting, it's a special meeting. And I see from our attendance list, we have a lot of new faces, a lot of new names anyway. And so what I wanted to do uh, very briefly was describe what the EVTOL Flight Test Council is about. And then we'll, uh, I'll hand it over to Dave uh, for the main show. Uh, a bit of admin first. When I sent out a link to my council people yesterday, I inadvertently sent my link. So a lot of you are listed under my name. Um, if you want to go on camera and ask a question, when you do that, you might want to say who you really are because your name will show, my name will show up in your with your face. Uh, but that's uh, my bad. So uh, sorry about that. Okay. So to uh, move on with the. Uh, introduction of the flight test council uh, again this is for those of you who are unfamiliar the uh, we organized just about a year ago almost almost a year ago was our first kickoff meeting in august and we're all about best practices for ev tall flight tests electric and vertical takeoff and landing aircraft it's the same sort of stuff that you'll see at sctp and the stuff you'll see at sfte and so forth uh, meetings and we we talk about our specialty but this is a, a venue focused on electric aircraft and the novel VTOL. Uh, we are primarily looking at the larger people-sized aircraft, but anybody with the smaller aircraft uh, that is interested in this are very much welcome as well. So the uh, the cargo delivery and the burrito deliverers and so forth, they're very much uh, welcome to join. So we're all about developing best practices for safety and certification and harmonizing and so forth, all that stuff that's uh, that's good for the uh, industrial community. We've been uh, meeting every two weeks at this time, and we have um, a fair number of, a very extensive list of reports and things we've been going through. We have launched an electric flight test council, which is just the electric part, and it's things having to do with battery and energy management and how we do it best in flight test. And of course, some of that trickles into how it's gonna be certified and sort of be some information in there. So for those of you who are not already familiar with this society, or excuse me, this council, or our committee under the council, uh, you can certainly uh, contact me uh, later on and I'll hook you up and we'll, we'll tie you in with the information. We have a, another count, a committee that we are launching under the council. It was, the name started off as the Flight Characteristics Committee and it has, sort of evolved in our first meeting, our launch meeting just a couple of weeks ago. And we come to realize that we need to address more than just flight characteristics. So we're looking at something more along the lines of means of compliance harmonization uh, between the Europeans and the Americans and other nations and other authorities. We're trying to come up with something that you test it once and everybody accepts it. And we're sort of a, a natural focal point for having those sorts of communications. So everything we do in this council is wide open. We have no secrets. Everything is postable. Everything is shareable. And so that's just how we roll. Everything is, uh, is quite wide open. We have a, a library courtesy of Vertical Flight Society. We have a little corner there where we keep our reports and these a uh, place to post, post webinars like this and so forth. All right. So that is the warm up introduction. And I believe we've had everybody's got a chance to tune in by now. So I would like to introduce uh, Dave Weber. He is a, a longtime flight test engineer, and he's been with the FAA for quite some years now. And, and Dave has been instrumental in helping to form this council and help direct what we do and where we go. And uh, he is a, a linchpin in terms of knowing how to certify these new class of aircraft. And a, a lot of people in this audience probably are not familiar with any kind of civil certification. We've certainly seen that over the last year. And so the idea of this webinar is to bring those uh, novices to civil certification up to speed, but also those who know something about cert civil certification, but don't know anything about eVTOL certification, which is pretty much everybody, right? Because it's so new. So Dave is going to talk to us about all that. Um, Dave, are you ready to take it? Yeah, I think I can take it out. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's see this. 
see if we can make this work. All right. How's that? Are you seeing the uh, screen? That's good. Okay, so a uh, quick introduction. Um, uh, so, so I'm a I'm a research flight test engineer, uh, about a 30 year point in my career, and I've spent about um, about half my career uh, in research and and half in certification flight test. Um, so, you know, when I when I look at EV tail certification, I look at it a bit like that guy with the pole in his hand there. Um, the the bar that he's got to jump over is is uh, Okay, let's see. All right. Um, so, so, so the the bar we're looking at there is is where, where do we set the safety standard for these vehicles, and then uh, how do we get over it? So, I, I think we all have a shared problem. We're all kind of like that guy trying to figure out uh, how to certify these vehicles. So, what I'm hoping to do today is um, is shed some light on that. Uh, in my in my years, I've uh, you know, I, I've, I've discovered when I, when I worked on the research side and worked on the military side, uh, you could very much treat a, a vehicle as a vehicle uh, and uh, just uh, look at the vehicle and, and work on the specifications for that vehicle, uh, do an operational evaluation of it. If you got to that point, if you're in research, you just look at the vehicle. Uh, and you can ultimately, if you have the means, you can figure out a way to, to use the tactical utility of that vehicle uh, in, your, in your military mission. Civil cert's a little bit different. Um, so civil cert uh, 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 tends to slice and dice its vehicles into categories and classes. And those categories and classes have, uh, have certain characteristics and they, um, they need to be understood and they need to be regulated. We're a regulatory agency, which I'll say many times. And I, uh, so it creates a little bit uh, different set of constraints that, that you have to work within. And I'm hoping I've got about Gosh, I got about 67 slides here, so I'm going to go through very quick, and 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 I'll tell you as I uh, as I put this together, um, I started putting this together years ago, and I did quite a bit of work to get ready for this webinar, and it seems like every time you pull on a thread, it takes you off in a different tangent, and that's kind of the nature of certification because it affects a whole lot of different people. So I tried to, using a flight test mindset, take a very complex subject. And try to boil it down, and I, and I hope uh, as we, as we get through this, everybody will will go away with some some nuggets to to, to, to think about. So, a couple dis disclaimers. I almost put a put a picture of a uh, of uh, uh, McCoy here. I, I, you know, I'm a I'm a flight test engineer, not a lawyer. And and by the way, uh, in the regulatory agency, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, we're a regulatory agency. The the amount of people that are actually lawyers in the FAA and in, 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 in uh, comparison to the total number of people in the FAA is quite small. Uh, we don't have a police force. Uh, so a bunch of us, uh, um, you know, there's a small amount of us engineers and then a whole bunch of, uh, of, of other FAA people uh, have to respect the regulatory process. And, and sometimes that's, that's, uh, that's uh, difficulties. And, and some of those difficulties and working through that uh, of what has, has led to orders and guidance and that type of thing. So anyway, so I'm going to attempt to shed some light on the on the regulatory process and try to use analogies, simple analogies, to try to give you a, a picture of what's going on. Uh, and I, I do want to state uh, right here, uh, I'm, I'm not going to offer, I'm not going to substantiate any kind of pre-decisional information. So everything I'm going to give you, uh, you can look it up yourself. Uh, it's it's available publicly, and that's a hallmark of a regulatory agency. Uh, you can imagine um, uh, you're, we're, we're all subject to the law, and uh, you'll see a slide in here a bit later that that, that hopefully drives that home. Uh, in the end, if you don't don't know the law, it's going to be on you. It's not going to be on anybody else. So so <laughs> with to, to try to be responsible, I'm not going to talk about any kind of pre-decisional information. But I I think you'll still see that this is quite helpful. So let's go into um, legal framework. So let's let's get get through this. So so purposes of this brief, uh, you know, a law and an act are are synonymous. Um, you know, law affects everybody, uh, and and an act is also a law. And and basically, the distinction between these two, is, uh, at least in its original intent, is that the law is is um, uh, the law and the act both have the same weight, 
uh, the law basically uh, gives you a broad view of, of, of intent and then uh, individual acts are used to uphold the law. So in those laws, uh, you know, the Department of Transportation is, is governs the Federal Aviation Administration. I'll probably use the wrong words there. So if there's any lawyers, I'll get in trouble. But, but FAA um, has these responsibilities. We've got regulation and oversight of the civil aviation and operation and development of the NAS. So, and I want to point out here, and I'll say it again, the FAA's mission is to provide the safest and our most efficient aviation system in the world. So when you think about that, we're not about safety at all cost. We're about uh, safety, but while upholding uh, our system as being the most, most efficient aviation system in the world. That means that there's compromises and, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So keep, keep that in mind. Okay, so how about a law versus regulation? Well, regulations, uh, are created by the governmental agency. So the FAA uh, do, is allowed to make uh, regulations and and the, um, the regulations don't really don't affect anybody who's not dealing directly with the agency who's enforcing them. However, this audience, that means that the regulations probably affect all of us. And then the regulations and, and the rules, um, the, the rules base basically, well, let's go into that here. The, the rules basically get into the details while the regulation covers the topic broadly. And an example I'll give you is, uh, is the parts. So if you think of each part as part of the you know, 14 Code of Federal Regulations part umpty squad, um, part one, part 11, part 21, part 27, those all have an intent. Uh, and then the, those regulations are typically made up of many individual rules. Uh, a rule and a regulation both have the force of law. We can't ignore them. Uh, and so when we talk about rulemaking, uh, we, have, we get concerned with precedence because if you have a rule that's under a regulation or part of a regulation, uh, we have to think about, well, if we change that rule, uh, is that gonna affect the overall regulation and the intent of the overall regulation? If so, um, it, it needs to be addressed and, and, it, and it gets us subject to um, uh, Administrative Procedures Act, which is part of the law, which uh, you'll see in a bit here that the, the law has uh, hierarchical precedence, or uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, the law overrides the, uh, the regulation. Regulation has to serve the law. So a couple of rulemaking characteristics. I didn't find this in any, um, any book. I just, uh, this is School of Hard Knocks. So so basically, the, uh, the rulemaking characteristics, they, they need to ensure the safety of civil aviation first and foremost. But you remember that mission statement where safety, uh, but most efficient system, there's some trade-offs. The, 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 you, you could keep every air vehicle on the ground, park it in a hangar, and you've got a very safe aviation system, but you've got no utility. So it's, uh, um, it, it doesn't work the efficiency. So we, you, we need to seek minimum safety standards. We, that's what we work with all the time. Um, the economic impact of any rulemaking has to be uh, um, looked at. And, you know, like I said, we like to group vehicles into different categories and classes. And so when, when, uh, when we make rulemaking, uh, we, we've got, we make some assumptions about a vehicle's capability. The um, rules need to be unbiased. I mean, what I mean by that is uh, you, you, they can be effective towards a given category and class. But as far as the, um, the public or the flying public is concerned uh, they, they, they can't can't discriminate we don't want to um, uh, and that's kind of a nod to the efficiency of the system that we need to re remain a general principle with with any kind of rulemaking is transparency uh, and uh, the rules shouldn't suppress innovation that's why uh, you'll when you hear the term performance-based uh, rulemaking which is the path uh, that the FAA is on uh, we don't want to dictate how you do something. We just want to tell you what needs to happen in order to meet that FAA's mission of uh, safety and efficiency. And like any rule, uh, it needs to be enforceable. And and uh, and so, in order to be enforceable, in most cases, particularly in our world, it needs to be measurable. And so, measurable, uh, we 
like to get into in our standards, means of compliance, what have you, all sorts of different names, but uh, but that you got to have a yardstick. So, so simple example, okay? Dirt farmer, flight test engineer. Here's an example of a rule. Uh, pretty clear is an operational rule, and uh, you can see that this rule uh, arguably gives you an acceptable safety for the society. Uh, it, it's uh, it's acceptable, and you can see it's it, it was done with transparency before these speed limit signs. I'm sure there was a council meeting or or a road meeting that that talked about what was coming. Um, the speed limit signs got posted, which gives you that uh, uh, that, that that transparency. It's measurable and it's enforceable. So is this a prescriptive rule? And I'm not really looking for an answer here, uh, but is it a prescriptive rule? Yes, it's prescriptive. Is it performance-based? Well, yes, it, it is performance-based because it's not telling you how to uh, limit yourself to, to 70 miles per hour. It's just uh, telling you what you need to do. So let's stay, drill it down a little bit on this. So, so what about this case? So in this case, uh, we're calling out a vehicle class. Uh, called trucks, and we're saying that the the trucks need to need to drive a little bit slower. And you know, you can imagine that those are, those assumptions. We're assuming what it, what the truck is and what its characteristics are. We're looking at the infrastructure, the road that it's driving on. Perhaps there's weather, winds. Who knows what happens in this part of the world and in this zone that we're trying to regulate? Um, but the um, for whatever reason, it's decided uh, that trucks need to have a lower speed limit than the overall population that, that that's using the using this zone. Let's look at another one here. So same upper speed limit and now there's a, a minimum speed. So maybe there's minimum design assurance is required. And there's a certified performance. You need to have a design assurance that, that a vehicle that's that's driving in this zone uh, can keep up a minimum speed. It has to be capable of that. If you can't, if you're driving an old Model A, if you're um, on a moped, uh, perhaps you uh, need to stay away from this zone where, and you know, we're not taking your freedoms away. You probably have another route uh, where you'll maintain the level of safety that's required for this zone for whatever reason. So what's in the name? Let's go back to this one, trucks. So this, uh, this vehicle, can it utilize the full performance capability uh, of this road? Well, I'd say it's a truck. That's probably the truck they're talking about, and uh, it, it's going to be limited to 60 miles per hour. If it's over 60 miles per hour, hey, knock yourself out. Uh, but if you get call, hauled into court, um, you've got the, the the visibility of this rule, and you will likely pay ticket. So the legal description is important to regulatory environment. So so that vehicle category class. Uh, needs to be defined, needs to be appropriate. And, and if, you, if you appropriately define your vehicle category class, um, you can actually take advantage, operational advantage that, that, that otherwise be limited. This is a truck. We know that as in slang, we call this a, call this a truck. But uh, my belief is, and I'd have to look it up, but I would imagine this piece of road right here uh, allows that vehicle to go 70 miles per hour because it's not a doesn't have the legal definition of truck that is that is referred to on that 60 mile per hour limit. So what about what about this? Here's a truck, um, and and this is a this, when a vehicle doesn't meet the assumed category and class capabilities. This oversized load in this case, we've all seen these. Typically, they've got um, a bunch of other cars flying in formation, if you will, to maintain the level of safety as these vehicles transit our infrastructure known as, known as a road. So these, these may be special operations and they may, they may require special handling. And you'll see the term special in a lot of the stuff that we have on the, on the FAA side as well. And it basically it's when it's something uncommon. And if, if we had a whole population, if we had tens of thousands of these vehicles on, on the road, more than likely, you can imagine we would create a set of roads for these vehicles, where we put them on another mode of transportation, or we would somehow separate them from the pot, from the from the primary population. If these special vehicles uh, are going to use the existing infrastructure, then we can do special handling. You know, we can put special rules. Uh, and the whole goal here is uh, rules take a while to put in place. They have to go through public comment or no, at least notice. 
And um, it, if we can special handle them and we can maintain the efficiency and the safety of the system, then we'll special handle them. Uh, if they're if they grow to a certain to a whole bunch of vehicles that that need this handling, that may be grounds for a new uh, regulation, a uh, new rule. It, it may uh, require new infrastructure or new space to operate so we can achieve the overall objective of, of transportation. And I'm talking at the Department of Transportation level. So vehicle category and class, what if we want to create something like this? Well, vehicles one, one, one part of this. And, and if you look in the part 1.1 1 .1, uh, definitions, you'll see category and class defined. And it's basically boils down to, it's a grouping. And it's a, it's a grouping of aircraft uh, based on intended use for operating limitations and similar characteristics. Why do we do that? Well, because then we, we can, we can, we can um, tailor our rules appropriately uh, so that we can maintain the NAS, we can have a, um, a safety level that, that's, that's publicly acceptable, and we can uh, recognize an efficiency in air transportation uh, that, that, that serves, serves the public uh, and, and serves, um, serves industry. So we talk, talked a bit about there about rules, uh, and then let's talk about policy and guidance, et cetera. So in that reference at rgl.fa.gov, uh, that I gave in one of the early slides. That RGL stands for Regulatory and Guidance Library, uh, and rgl.fa.gov gives you a window into uh, rules. It gives you uh, policy, it gives you guidance, advisory circulars, notices, all sorts of uh, publicly available information. Policy and guidance uh, falls below the legally enforceable uh, line, but it's also very important. And, and policy gives you a strategic path of how to how to work through the code of federal regulations um, advisory circulars uh, give you guidance and in some cases you can find a, a guidance uh, i'll give you an example if you're if you're certifying an uh, a glider you will actually refer to an advisory circular for a set of standards for that glider so in there in the in the advisory circular format they're not regulatory However, if you take those uh, take those standards and you then apply them to a vehicle and you put it on the uh, the, the type of certificate uh, certification basis, uh, then that raises it up to a, a regulatory legally enforceable um, um, product. So we'll talk more about that as we go. So orders and notices, uh, you know. To, to anybody entering this realm, looking into the civil certification I offer to you, read these orders and notices. Invariably, there's errors. They they get changed regularly. They get changed through a uh, uh, through a lot of um, uh, interaction among different groups, and people have a lot of different different perspectives. But overall, you can at least uh, I find that you can you can start to see the intent in here, and you can also see a lot of school of hard knocks. You've seen. Uh, other vehicles have gone through certification and, and there's some gems in here on, on how to get through certification. So really look at these orders and notices uh, and use these to try, try to figure out the path through certification. I'm gonna try to help you today and hopefully, and, and everything I'm giving you today, by the way, uh, pulls from these as well. The, those pictures you see there, I mean, that's your basic type certification order, 8110.4, I think we're at Charlie right now. Um, you can see, uh, uh, Standardized procedures for for issue papers. Talk a little bit about that. That's 8110.112, uh, and then I even added uh, that picture there, the order 8110.121, and that talks to the type certificate data sheet notes. Because you would think that notes, um, you know, they're just notes, right? Well, the fact of the matter is, is once the notes go into a type certificate data sheet, uh, that becomes a a uh, framework that that's legally enforceable. So the way you write those notes is very important, and those notes are um, are added in here to try to guide uh, us engineers who are not lawyers uh, in in how we um, how we present something that needs to stand the test of time. It's just about one of the things you find in the legal world is things need to be durable and they need to be enforceable. And and uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a backdrop 
on how the FAA is structured. And I think you'll see why it's so important that early on, uh, when we're in the engineering realm, we we get these things somewhat right. And and uh, um, anyway, enough enough for now. Let's move on. You'll see. I hope you'll see why why I'm saying that. Oh, and the one other thing I would say about orders and notices is use these because these orders and notices uh, they give you a common source. So so if it's possible to use common language among a uh, uh, multiple lines of business uh, that all that are going to be building on your on your vehicle certification basis, if you can use common words, you use common words because it, it keeps the confusion level down. And that will save you time in certification in the long run. It's never easy going through certification. It's even harder when we're making up new stuff. So to that point, so eVTOL, advanced air mobility, thinking out of the box, innovative, collaborative. We've got new operational use cases coming. I mean, there's there, there's a ton of them, right? All these all these vehicles and ideas, different ways of of solving common problems or in um, some of these new operational use cases, I've been focusing a lot on urban air mobility, but uh, you know this could be cargo ops, it could be uh, inner city, it could be uh, you know all sorts of um, either advances in existing operational use cases or new operational use cases altogether. I want to, you know, thinking out of the box is is a great thing, but when is, when we're talking about the application of vehicle certification regulations to EV to advanced air mobility, this is where I'm going to offer an opinion. Um, thinking out of the box is not the same as coloring outside of the lines. Okay, the um, the the regulatory process is designed to be very stable. I had a picture that Alan knows. I was trying to find it that that I've given other briefings, and it's a picture of a of a giant cargo ship and uh and uh, trucking across the water the thing's got massive inertia and and probably relatively speaking a tiny rudder and that's a bit like what the government is and and i would offer that that's what we want the government to be you want the government to be stable you don't want it rapidly zigzagging around there's a lot of talk of agile government but i believe the agile government works below the um below the rule area and and uh um what we don't want to do is reinvent the whole certification process. As I went through it, particularly for this briefing and in, in the years that I've been trying to get this point across, um, the, uh, it, it, it becomes obvious that the founding fathers of the regulatory process, the framework that we have, is actually pretty durable and it's, and it's pretty good. Uh, is it confusing? Yes, it is. And hopefully we're going to help clear some of that. And that's largely because uh, we're a bunch of engineers, and and we're working in, a, in under a legal um, system. So the characteristics of coloring out the side of the lines uh, when it comes to vehicle certification, in my opinion, it may be cute. Um, it may look like innovation, but it's probably not of lasting value, and that's a that's a foot stopper. So here's your basic legal hierarchy. Uh, you know, you, you see that line below the guidance policies. Those are not legally enforceable until they're rolled up into a, a regulatory certification basis or, or what have you. And that's where agility exists. Uh, we, we've now, uh, we've always had this capability actually to, to do alternative methods of compliance, alternative means of compliance, that's always existed. Uh, and, but uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about part 23 and performance-based rules. That's exactly what part 23 does. It didn't change the, um, the the regulation so much the part 23 is still part 23 uh it's still no normal category airplanes but it offered a performance based rulemaking and what that's done is it allows a lot of work to to happen below that line in the not legally enforceable line and what's great is we can make uh, very uh relatively quick changes to means of compliance uh because we're not changing them in the rule, which, which has uh, all the concerns of precedence and, and public notice. Uh, but ultimately, they do need to get rolled up into a regulatory certification basis. So at, at some point, they come out of the um, out into the uh, public realm. So just want to make you aware of that. So here's a quick summary. Uh, law and an act, basically the same thing. 
uh, uh, regulation and a rule. Uh, we, we do this all the time in the FAA. We'll talk about regulations, we'll talk about rules in a very simple sense. And uh, it'll probably be argued after this, but, but, uh, but, but since I've got the, got the mic, um, a rule and a regulation is, each have, are legally enforceable, but a rule is, is basically bits and pieces uh, of a regulation. So uh, there, it's a big, it, it, it's a job to change a rule. It's a job to enact a rule. It's a job to get rid of a rule. Um, it's a bigger job to change a regulation. Uh, and in many ways, we're, we're faced here with, uh, with a bunch of, uh, you, you know, I was, I was having dinner with, with um, David Clyde a couple of weeks ago. And, and we both mused on the fact that, wow, you know, and uh, we're both around, uh, sorry, I may get this wrong, Dave, if you're out there, uh, you were around the 30 year uh, in, our, in our career. And it's hard to remember a time when we've had this tremendous amount of innovation going on. And uh, uh, in a lot of ways, we're, we're looking at, at potential uh, birth of, of new operational use cases. It, so it's interesting. It, it's it's kind of like a, the, the analogy when I think about this is, is you have to make a, you've got, got the birth of something new, uh, just like think of it as, as, your, as your child. Um, do you build a new room for the child or do you adapt an existing room for the child? Well, for the child, it may make sense to, to, to adapt an existing room uh, because you know that, that child is going to uh, eventually have the same needs and wants that, that, that you have. But what happens if you're if you're trying to enact uh, if you're if you're trying to bring in a, a you know 100 children or 10,000 children of of, uh, of different needs and wants and you and you may need to build a new room. You may need to build a new regulation. But that work, since that's a tremendous amount of work, and since so we know how aviation is. Uh, there's been promise of many different types of new innovative technologies that haven't made it for whatever reason. The, uh, the regulatory rule process is that we're, we're not going to change those rules in practice until uh, the, the vehicles start, start to show up. So in the meantime, we can work right down there in the green. And like Al alluded to earlier, um, we can work the harmonization issues. We can work the standards. We can figure out uh, what these vehicles are and what their care and feeding is, and ultimately let that um, let as we learn more about that, it will start to become apparent as more and more of these vehicles grow whether whether we need to uh, make changes to the rules, changes to the regulations to to uh, to accommodate those vehicles. So hopefully you're with me. I'm going to pause and take a breath here. Yes, I'll take a breath, take a breath here, and, and see if there's any questions. Over to you, Al. Hey, um, I've been uh, watching the uh, question chat and uh, just basic questions about will this be available later on? And yes, it's being recorded. It'll be posted on YouTube and the slides will be made available. But that's all I got for questions so far. Anybody? Uh, okay. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, type them in. I'm watching them as the show goes here. Back to you. Okay, so let's get into certification a little bit. Uh, so let's talk about, first of all, what I'm keeping an eye on the time, uh, but what is certification? Well, it's, it's more than, um, it's more than just the capability of the aircraft. So certification is almost, it was, is always a subset of the vehicle's capabilities. It's, uh, and it's an, it's, it's basically saying that, that the regulatory requirements, so the rule or set of rules, uh, have been met. And not only that they have been met, but they'll continue to be met. And that's that durability and enforceability thing. Uh, we, I, I live in the vehicle certification world, but the, throughout the FAA, everybody's doing certification to, to some level. So there's, there's different um, well-proven risk-based processes for, for all these different lines of business. And, and once again, you know, did there to uphold uh, this, uh, this FAA mission to provide safest, most efficient aviation system in, in the world. So why, why certify? Well, first we have to, uh, the law, the law demands that, we, demands that we do, but that certification basis, it, it's, the goal is to provide safety assurance and, and 
you know, we're ultimately beholden to the public and, you know, the level of safety for for one operational use case is, is not the same as another. So you can, you know, you a lot of uh, work in the small drones area. Uh, and But if you're dealing with a drone or if you're dealing with a um, R25 transport airplane with, with 300 people on board, you can imagine that the, the level of safety is adjusted uh, and it's largely driven by social acceptance of, of, of accidents uh, for, for, for those vehicles. We recognize I'm in vehicle certification. That's great. We don't own it all. Uh, we, we, we are at the forefront of everything. I do believe that, that the, vehicle, the work we do in vehicle certification is foundational because we're right there on the airworthiness and, and design part. But the uh, overall safety assurance, you've got operating rules, you've got uh, pilot training, you've got uh, maintenance, uh, airspace, uh, 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 separation standards, you've got terminal procedures, uh, and you've got the environment that, that the vehicles are flying in. Well, what are the operational threats? And it doesn't take a, a, a rocket scientist to realize that the operational use case is absolutely critical, and you need to know that up front, because uh, when you when you're going to set, set the standards for a vehicle, you've, you've got to understand what environment it's operating in. So we call it vehicle certification basis. If you go to the uh, Oxford English Dictionary, uh, basis and foundation are synonyms. So, so it's a certification basis, vehicle certification basis. Uh, it needs to be foundational. If not, uh, if, you, if you don't do a good job with the foundation, you end up with something like this. Let's talk about the importance of assumptions. Um, this is uh, this is uh, fresh and painful in our minds. The uh, the 737 Max crash, and I won't go into any details on it. But uh, uh, but if you look at the, the Office of the Inspector General's uh, uh, investigation that was called as a result of two accidents with the 737 Max, you'll notice the the almost the first thing that was looked at was the certification process, and the question was. Did the FAA, a regulatory agency, did they follow the law? Did they follow the certification process? The answer was yes, the process was, was, was followed. And that was a good thing. And it was below the, it was below the process where assumptions and what have you, um, uh, there, there's always a, a lot of things that lead into an accident. So I'm not gonna get into those details, but um, you, you can see that beyond the process is, is where the problems occurred. But it's a good thing the process was followed, and I will offer that the, the, the process has been established over a long period of time, and it, it's actually well proven. So, so let's talk about this. So the importance of the certification process. So a bunch of innovators in the audience, and, and, and if I offer to you as innovators that, that uh, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here close to, in a, in a hotel room right now, close to Silicon Valley, and, and if I told you the importance of the certification process, discipline, practice, predictability, strict rule following, if I get a face like that, like, like, like really, um, I, I, thought, I thought the FAA was trying to be, be more innovative. And, and I get that, but uh, I, I want to uh, show you, give you a little bit of perspective on the nature of the FAA. So, so you can take this and think about this. Uh, and we're going to come back to those uh, those four traits that I talked about. So first of all, who are we? Here, here's the, here's here's the key FAA functions: with aviation safety, air traffic organization, and airports. So AVS uh, is my big boss. I work for aircraft certification. Uh, you notice that aircraft certification is is kind of an engineering centric organization. Uh, we work uh, closely with flight standards under AVS. And they're more of a uh, operations and maintenance inspector centric organization. And if you've worked in, I mean, even in research flight test or, or military, there, there's, a, there's a bit of a different mindset when it comes to engineering versus uh, inspector. So uh, you don't typically have uh, inspector dispositions, you have engineering dispositions and, and engineering needs to come back with, yeah, I know I wrote it that way, but what I intended to say was this, and, and it becomes very important that, that how you say something and how you write something down um, is, is usable by the inspectors who are ultimately going out in the field to, um, to enact what, what the engineer 
tried to say and what the, the engineer tried to do. So let's get a get a, a look at scale, and this is a, this is important. So so FAA lines of business. Look, I, I don't know how many times I tell somebody I work for the FAA, they go, "Oh, are you an air traffic controller?" Well, no, um, you know that's that's the lion's share of the FAA lines of business. The air traffic organization is about thirty two thousand personnel. Uh, AVS is about 7,400, and airports um, is fairly small. That's about 600 personnel. Um, and then the staff offices. So you end up with about 45,000 people in the FAA. So we're going to focus on the AV AVS here with 7,400 personnel. Um, this organization uh, responsible for certification, production approval, airworthiness, uh, and, and certification of pilots, mechanics, and others. So they do a lot of stuff in, in AVS. So let's take a look here. Let's uh, to drill down a bit further. So here's here's AVS. There's the different lines of business under under AVS. We talked about aircraft certification and flight standards. Um, you can see that there's an AUS uh, division, which was used to be unmanned. I think that it's um, it's it's evolving a bit. Uh, the AUS now is covering a lot of the uh, uh, piloted as well as unmanned, but larger vehicles. Uh, still finding our way there. There's rulemaking. Why is there rulemaking? Well. Footstopper, we're a regulatory agency. Uh, rulemaking is a is a job in in and of itself, uh, and it's a it's a translator to translate a bunch of engineering speak into into legal and make sure that we're following the the governing process, which we are all beholden to. Accident investigation, aerospace medicine, all um, are, are important uh, and very important because you the forensic evidence and the uh, and the medical evidence uh, often feeds into uh, the, the standards that we're applying to vehicle certification. Once again, 750 to 1300 engineers. Um, I think it was Dan Elwell, uh, in, in the max at, max accident mentioned that about seven, the reason I used 750 personnel, he, he talked to 750 per personnel who are actively doing aircraft certification. So basically, um, we're around 2% of the total FAA is engineering. And, and I say that for a reason that, that, that we're at the leading edge, uh, the bleeding edge is one of my colleagues has mentioned, but uh, uh, um, we're a small part of the total FAA population. What we come up with has to have legs. It has to uh, be acceptable and usable by the rest of the, of the FAA. So drill down a bit more. So, so here's aircraft certification service. Uh, we went through a recent reorganization. So you can see the three Columns at the top there, the um, policy and innovation is Air 600, appliance and airworthiness is Air 700, and system oversight is Air 800. And, and basically, um, uh, policy and innovation is involved uh, in, in the early stages. Uh, the, the appliance and airworthiness is, is, are the people that are tasked with actually issuing uh, uh, design approvals and doing foreign validations. Uh, so, and, and, and then System oversight, I can't leave that one out because all the work that gets done up front, uh, as Dan Elwell, the reason he mentioned the 750 uh, FAA personnel who are actively involved with certification, uh, he was responding to Congress who was saying, hey, how, um, how, come you're, how come you have delegated organizations and DERs? How can you do all that? How come you, FAA doesn't do it themselves? And that was in the wake of the MAX accident. So, of course, uh, well, we regularly have to answer those questions. Let's write. Why? There's only 750, and I believe Dan Elwell. Uh, I hope I'm getting the right name here since this is being recorded. But I, but I believe uh, uh, his, his reply was, uh, uh, "We would need about 10,000 and, and X billion dollars to be able to do it all on our own." Uh, so we have to delegate, and one of the, the the foundations of delegation is the standards need to be published. They need to be available. If it's new and novel, it's inherently governmental. Um, but when it becomes bread and butter of work that we that we can delegate to other organizations or individuals, it has to be written written down. It has to be vetted, and that um, that I put regulatory majority there, but that could be um, you know, it could be rules, it can be advisory. You've got to have some maturity in, in what gets printed and becomes publicly available because that forms a basis for. The ability for those those delegated organizations and individuals to do their job. So I mentioned uh, uh, I used to work in the aircraft certification office. I've, I'm now uh, largely 
uh, working on on standards and doing some some certification. But in we've got another part of the reorganization is we've created a national flight test branch. So we've got about 70 flight test pilots, flight test engineers in total, uh, and we're a national organization. And basically, we we report to that compliance and airworthiness, Air 700. Uh, however, our uh, our mission statement is published in 8110.5D, I think, or 8100.5D. Anyway, uh, uh, talks to our um, our mission is to is to support the, those those three divisions and provide flight test expertise uh, to to those uh, groups, and that's that's what we do. Any question on the overall? Um, uh, Back, backdrop for certification. This will be a quick one out. If there's any. Okay, I'm not. Uh, How about now? Can you hear me now? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, no, no new questions. Uh, you are rocking it. Just keep going. Okay, I'll, I'll keep on going. Can I keep an eye on the time? So what's the goal of certification of these new innovative eVTOL advanced air mobility vehicles? Well, I'm not gonna answer that yet, but let me give you an example. Um, we're all familiar with formation flying. So we a good goal. We wanna move in complete harmony in a confined space. Uh, we've got some key enablers, um, you know, the flight lead. You have one flight lead. They're doing, uh, they're basically typically uh, most experienced. If you're flying similar aircraft, maybe they're flying the uh, the, the most stable aircraft or the least uh, agile aircraft. They typically becomes the uh, the flight lead if it's a dissimilar form formation. And the wingmen, um, they're working hard. They're working really hard. They're, they've got a high physical workload, but they're alleviated in doing their physical workload because they're following the lead of the of the flight lead, who's who's making the the, the, the navigation decisions and calling and and of course, you um, try to pre-flight. Well, you don't try to. You pre-flight brief this uh, uh, before you go. But look at the characteristics that make it work. And this is where I come back to what I mentioned earlier: discipline, practice, predictability, and strict rule following. That's what makes uh, the the form formation work. Uh, if the if the lead is is yanking and banking all over the sky um, without a good reason, that 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 raises the workload of everybody, every wingman uh, that's trying to fly formation on that vehicle. And it, it's a breakdown. And um, But so if you do this right, if you use discipline, practice, predictability, and strict rule following, you end up with a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. This is this, so, so you, this is what we're looking for, I believe. I think this is a, an analogy of what we're looking for with, with eVTOL, advanced air, air mobility. You notice with eVTOL, I put a slash there because uh, we're not sure what to call it, and it may or may not be E, but it's, uh, it is advanced um, uh, air, air mobility. So here, it's, it, it's analogous. I could have put up a, um, a picture of a, of a, a Navy aircraft carrier operation. It, it, it's the same type of thing. We're not just concerned with the vehicle, I don't think. We want to create a system where these vehicles can move in complete harmony. Uh, in the urban environment, that confined space takes on its own own reason. But uh, uh, it, but the enablers, you know, what, what, what do we have? We need a uh, appropriate certification basis, so the vehicle uh, forms a foundation. Um, we need to know what are the appropriate operational rules. Uh, they also need to recognize or re re recognize what, what what the vehicles are capable of, uh, and are more importantly are assured to do under all, all circumstances. And we need to have appropriate infrastructure. So the same characteristics that we talked about before make this work. And I think uh, I think that it's important that we uh, use the innovation for the vehicles. Uh, if we have new operational use cases and new infrastructure requirements, we can get some uh, innovation there. But I just recommend when it comes to certification, uh, we use what we have. And that, actually that's in line with, with what's being Said in, said in the public, we're, we're not making any regulatory changes for the advent of, of advanced air mobility. Um, there will be rulemaking, uh, it, uh, it appears to be. Um, and 
but in, in the end, the the result we want to hold that's greater than the sum of the parts as we uh, see the advent of these new operational use cases. And if you think about it, we haven't had any new operational use cases, uh, arguably, in about 30 years. I can remember uh, in 1995 on the X31, uh, we, we took the X31 to the Paris Air Show, and I remember uh, the V22 and the and the XV15 were there uh, at the um, at the show, or maybe it was the early version of the AW609. But the, anyway, it's um, it. it it's been a while since we've created uh, operational use cases. It's um, and for the numbers that we're looking at with advanced air mobility, I think it's really important to uh, focus on foundation. And here's that reminder. I promise, FAA is a regulatory agency, so um, you know, and those regulations only affect those who deal directly with the agency who is enforcing them. And <laughs> This is a reminder, and, and, and uh, uh, to use one of my, one of my colleagues uh, he likes to say, it's a, it's a foot stomper. The, the enforcers are probably not the two percent you're dealing with early in the, in certification. So do your homework, know the law. Um, if if uh, if there's somebody tells you you can drive 100 miles per hour down a road that's 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 limited to 70, uh, and you get pulled over by somebody else. Uh, and it's not the, it's really not the uh, person who pulls you over that gives you, that has the, in, the enforceability. It's the, uh, it's when you get in front of the judge and, and the, the judge will say, yeah, you, ignorance of the law is not, not an excuse. So, so I think it's uh, just very important that everybody working in this space takes the time and it may not be what you want to do, but get, get smart with all this publicly available information that's uh it's transparent for a reason so in hey, certification hey david i'll just okay. interrupt for just a, a quick second here on the subject of regulations you just got a question uh okay. about what what is the collaboration or harmonization between the uh, faa and other foreign authorities B a big picture answer yeah, so I, I can only with that one. I can only talk to what I'm I'm aware of. Uh, I think um, uh, through, through forums like this, we have collaborations. Uh, re regularly talk uh, via uh, standards organizations. But as far as uh, um, I, I know that uh, EASA has done a, uh, a very good job of, of, of pub publicly putting out uh, basically advanced. Uh, a notice of proposed rulemaking and and have sought comments, um, and and uh, so we FAA has been involved with 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 responding to those and has given some some inputs and there's been meetings. So uh, that is that's normal operating for for the FAA to to work these international harmonization issues, um, and there's a fair amount of that going on. But there's, uh, I, I'll also offer just from my view that it's fairly, um, fairly fragmented, and I think we could all agree to that. And uh, it, it, I, I do notice that, that through through the work of the the EVTOL uh, flight test council, we're attempting to to slice and dice and, and bring some um, uh, cross product information and, and get that harmonization going. But it, is it? I'm not sure how formal it is at at this point. So it's kind of a wishy-washy answer, Al. Did did I was I did I answer? Yeah, it just it sounds like you're you're trying, um, and and we our council is trying to do that too. We're we're serving as sort of a a neutral uh, venue for having those conversations. Um, yeah. So there you go. Yeah, and and it's real and it's real important because uh, it it would be it, it's not going to help the industry as a whole. If we're not on the same page, so so it's a it's a challenge to get on the same page. So I don't know so. So basically, certification. Uh, you know, AVS is involved with aircraft, airmen, uh, and is aware of infrastructure. So we've got uh, different groups that come up with the infrastructure, and uh, in a very simple sense, you can think of airport and heliport uh, standards. Um, and we have to understand what that 
what is the status quo and when, what is the viable path in order to make make decisions because particularly in flight test uh, we're we're very driven by category and class and what i mean by that is if you if you read the definition you'll, you'll see that it breaks down to um, uh, common characteristics of flight uh, landing uh, and propulsion and if you read a little bit further on class when you start to read the class you'll read the definitions of the of, of airplane and helicopter and powered lift you start to realize that that, that when we talk about uh, characteristics of propulsion it's not really electric versus uh, uh, fossil fuel or anything like that it's more a characteristic of of how is that uh, propulsion enacted for flight uh, is it is propulsion being used to uh, create forward speed to, to put Bernoulli's over the wing to give you lift or is uh, is propulsion being used uh, is it spinning a, uh, a rotor or something like that to put Bernoulli's over a wing to give give lift it those different characteristics uh, tend tend to be lead to different limitations in, in the vehicle characteristics. And if you can understand the, uh, uh, the limitations and capabilities of a vehicle, it starts to make sense to uh, ha how to put them into categories and classes so you, so you can maintain, maintain that efficiency and, and safety that we're looking for. So into the code of federal regulations, the, uh, the good book, so to speak. And, um so it, it, these are all like i said regulations which are legally enforceable uh the parts think of the parts as regulations and then think of anything inside those parts as rules whether that's technically correct or not i'll probably you know uh I, like i said i'm gonna go go back and say i'm a i'm an engineer not a lawyer but I think it's important to see how the Code of Federal Regulations is, is organized. You've got definitions and abbreviations up front. You won't find everything you need here, but uh, but they tell you a lot. And each one of those has gone through public, um, at least public notice and, uh, and probably public comment. You got some general requirements in part three, it talks about airworthy. Airworthy basically conforms to type design. Type design is just critical with, with, uh, with certification because we certify we make a design approval. And then, of course, it's in a condition for safe operation, which we all know for, particularly if you're a pilot. Um, part 11, general rulemaking procedures. Uh, this is where there's reference to uh, what's above the regulation, a law. So, and particularly the Administrative Procedures Act. <clears throat> Act is a law. Act is a portion of a law. It has the same uh, legal requirements uh, as a law. So the Administrative Procedures Act is there, and we talked a bit to this. Uh, you can see what, through EASO that they're doing a lot of advanced uh, notice of proposed rulemaking with a goal to get to a notice of proposed rulemaking and ultimately a final rule. So they're making some some changes in their structure, and that, uh, in in my book, just basically assures transparency. Uh, it, it, it makes sure that the that the uh, industry that's going to be regulated is involved with uh, the process to determine what are appropriate regulations. And uh, that's just smart. So uh, in, in part 11, you'll, you'll notice, uh, and I, I point this out because uh, special condition is, is talked about a lot. Uh, well, and, and I should probably change that because I say, there I say regulation, I'm just realizing I should change that to rule. Special control condition is, is a rule, and, and it's, uh, uh, it's applied to a particular aircraft design. And then uh, uh, 13 to 17, I couldn't handle it. It's all legal stuff, um, but it's just, uh, I, I put it there so you can read it on, at your own leisure. Uh, but the point is, is that all comes before we get to uh, the um, Part 21 certification processes. And it reminds us that we are, in fact, a uh, regulatory agency. A little bit on the part one definitions and abbreviations. I think we had a meeting back and I'd ask people to go into part one and take a look at the definitions and abbreviations that in part one, a couple of them are here. I won't go into any of the details, although I that it is interesting when you get to um, definition of a person. Uh, it's not necessarily an individual. It can be a firm, partnership, corporation, company, association. And that term person gets used uh, downstream in, in the um, 
in, in the parts as you go from go from left to right or from top to bottom. I have to mention special. Special is all over the FAA. And when you look at this, the really the best definition for this is not in part 1.1, um, but it is uh, in Webster's Dictionary and Oxford Dictionary. It's basically otherwise different from what is usual. And uh, so, you know, some of the synonyms, unique, uncommon, unusual, noteworthy, in comparison to the status quo. Well, uh, what is special today, uh, hopefully will not be special when our grandchildren are flying on. So uh, the elevator was special when it was first introduced. Uh, what we envision is that advanced air mobility is special now, uh, but one day will be common. So you can see how we how we treat that. Um, there's a lot. There's this is just an example, and there's I see special all over the place. Special class, you know, it could be an airship or a glider. Um, special condition, that's a that's a special condition under underneath the part. In that case, that example I've got there, the Airbus envelope protection, that's a that's a, a, a special rule uh, that's under the Part 25 regulation. Uh, special certification. Quite often, there's there's unique helicopter instrument procedures, uh, maybe or maybe it could be a steep approach certification for a for an airplane, um, special VFR, special airworthiness information bulletin. The, the the list goes on and on and on. Don't get too hung up on it. It just means it's uncommon, and you know we can figure that out. So developing the certification basis, let's let's talk about that. So so part 21, this this defines certification procedures for products and parts. And aircraft is a product um, made up of a bunch of parts, typically. And and uh, so so part 21 defines procedures and process. And then you got these different parts. These are regulatory rule sets, regular regulations uh, that have, for whatever reason, were decided. Probably because uh, we had a, a large number of vehicles that all had similar care and handling and and because there are so many of them it made sense to build parts for each of them so we've got uh, airworthiness requirements for for airplanes uh, we've got airworthiness requirements for transport airplanes we've got them for uh, rotorcraft and transport rotorcraft and helicopters are a subset of those um, we even have airworthiness requirements for man-free balloons uh, and then part 33 and 35 Talk to you about those requirements for engines and propellers, and you'll you'll find that uh, uh, those regulations uh, and then the rules that are underneath them sometimes the rules either don't make se sense or are missing. Uh, so so you um, you may need to come up with special conditions, which is a rule uh, typically uh, applied to one of these regulations. Um, equivalent level level safety findings can be done. Those are not rules. Uh, but there are ways of uh, of treating uh, within the reg regulation and exemptions, which are rarely used. Here's our type certification process. Uh, once again, this is um, uh, it's from that 8110.4. Uh, and this, in general, there's several phases. I've I've kind of combined them here: the uh, conceptual design, requirements definition, you got compliance planning, implementation phase, and post certification activities. And I'm I'm putting this up just as a like I said go to go to the source 8110.4 uh, I believe we're at Charlie uh, and you can find that in our GL. But I want to focus on this part: finalize the certification basis or continue at risk. So um, this this falls in the in requirements definition. I want to focus on that. Let's we'll spend a little bit of time on on these charts. So if you uh, tuned in a while ago, or, uh, I I didn't say this in my intro, but a large part of my job right now, I'm, I'm working with the NASA Advanced Air Mobility National Campaign. And uh, we did some surrogate, uh, UAM surrogate vehicles. We started down this path uh, to, to try to figure out uh, requirements for uh, advanced air mobility concepts, urban air mobility being one uh, operational use case. So this is actually uh, the, um, got some flight data and some and some uh, flight manual data, and then some calculations. But this is basically around an OH-58 Charlie, which is what we use as an initial UAM surrogate vehicle for our initial studies. 
and and we've, we've come up with a way to present the approach constraints chart. And so this is a calm wind you can see on the uh, x-axis there's your basically your speed uh, and uh, we've got descent rate on the on the y-axis and why descent rate uh, we have descent rate there because largely we're looking at uh, landing we're, we're thinking about category and class and we're thinking of um, uh, what, what, what kind of landing makes sense for for, for this uh, this category and class so I did these uh, so if we, if we so even though this is an OH58 Charlie uh, as a as a UAM surrogate vehicle, right now, and 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 if you do a normal, completely normal, typical normal airplane uh, certification in subpart B, uh, which is performance, building control, trim, um, it would our design assurance that that uh, that that we're looking at. If you just use a standard uh, advisory circular 23.8, uh, I'm sorry, dash eight Charlie, I think. You you end up with um, a need to determine design assurance. You've got to stall uh, at the at the left side of this the certified envelope, so to speak. Um, you typically your your typical nominal approach path is a three degree, but through the course of subpart B certification, you probably have a vehicle that can be assured to be probably five degrees. Is is uh, it can handle a five degree. Uh, abuse uh, approach angle and still exhibit all of the subpart B qualities that you want. Um, I don't really have the the max speed there. This is a, the, the only 58 Charlie. Uh, we only needed to go out to about 120 knots. Uh, and But that's basically a, a visual of the characteristics that you need to certify to. And you'll notice, um, uh, I should have put a line there on the thousand foot per minute descent rate. But uh, the vehicle can do more than that. Um, but this is this is considered to be uh, stable. This is all stable flight. So so the, the one of the key enablers for a three degree glide path is the ability to fly a steeper uh, glide path without being out of um, out of throttle margin, so to speak. So you might you should have enough drag capability to be able to do a, a five degree. Interestingly enough, part twenty five. Uh, for an airplane calls out that that if you certify to part 25 requirements then your vehicle is assured to handle four and a half degree um, glide path if you want to do more than more than a four and a half degree glide path you have to do a special certification uh, steep approach certification for the vehicle which typically involves uh, not just vehicle but it involves flight standards operations and and um, uh, Got to understand the infrastructure that you're flying into. And I'll try to keep an eye on time and move a little bit faster here. So this, uh, and I didn't quite draw this right as I look at it again, but uh, you know, what about UAM uh, steep approach? This is this is kind of the the, the open research question we have. Um, if you assume you're passenger carrying ops, which we, we look at urban air mobility as being passenger carrying ops, that's uh, that's not necessarily completely true yet, but we're evolving. But uh, if you look at urban air mobility, you've got a descent rate of uh, probably less than 1,000 feet is what you want for your passenger comfort. And you start to see what glide path angles you can fly in. And and this um, this assumes an operation in heliports, vertiports, and airports. This green area, it starts to become the area that you want your, um, your certification basis to address. And then this is maybe, you know, this this one where the steep approach here, where we're looking at maybe a nine degree nominal, eleven degree abuse. Can your vehicle even fly that? And then is it is it certifiable to do that glide path angle? If it's not, maybe we, we need uh, urban air mobility with a more of a moderate approach. And this one is a uh, is notional of maybe what a what a six degree approach would be. And there's an area there in the in the lower left corner, which uh, before the questions come. Yeah, there should be more there. It shouldn't come to zero, but I was drawing this quickly in an airport yesterday. So forgive me. And then there could be other uh, advanced air mobility operational use cases that don't that are, aren't concerned about passenger comfort. Um, cargo comes to mind. Uh, so so this one may may allow for higher descent rates uh, for efficiency. Maybe they're slower. There's uh, this is just very notional. Um, as a the, the point here is that that as an innovator. 
uh, it's really important as you come out of your conceptual phase and you get into your requirements definition phase that you determine what is the operational use case and really think about um, what you want to certify because what you certify is is what the rest of the world is going to uh, assume you're able to do under under all conditions so the pipe certification process this is a uh, an eye chart i'm going to go through these fairly quick because we're short on time but all this is an 8110.4 charlie but uh in point to that top left the requirements definition you know, you're going to establish a a type certificate process, a project, and there's a lot of things that are done. You know, certification plan, um, FAA, remember 750 to 1300 engineers, it's not a whole lot. And the, you'll find that when you're innovative, you'll get, a, get more help than, than, than you probably need, quite frankly. But ultimately there's a, there's a whole bunch of other uh, applicants who are also looking for, for FAA time. So, um, the uh, certification project plan takes on some importance in in, in terms of uh, uh, it has to be reasonable. The the timeline has to be reasonable because uh, because ultimately we we cannot uh, we have to serve the entire uh, FAA uh, regulated applicants and we also have to do international validation. So it becomes a, a workload issue when it's new and novel. Uh, the use of DERs is, is is hampered, quite frankly, because we don't have those published standards. So it, it's a big uh, it's a big hit on the on the limited FAA resources. Um, I'm going to skip through these in the interest of time. This is a, a you know basically I just want to show that the team is uh, you know you can have a project manager, you can have tech specialists, flight test pilots. Manufacturing inspectors, um, AEG, uh, this is the first time I've introduced that. AEG is the Aircraft Evaluation Group. They're basically uh, flight standards personnel who understand the nuances of, of certification and they get involved with certification. Uh, so they they work with uh, with engineering and, and we try to work very closely between the, uh, uh, the engineering side and the Aircraft Evaluation Group, which consists of uh, in, uh, aviation safety inspectors eyes uh, for both uh, ops, you know, piloting and uh, and airworthiness maintenance. Hey Dave, um, I would say yeah. don't sweat the time too much. We've got really good attendance going strong and this is so valuable and we're going to record it anyway. So if you have time, you, you can go ahead and stretch it and, and, and do the okay. whole deal. Okay. All right. So you'll see the, uh, if it's, uh, depends on the, Depends on the pr project whether you need a type, a formal type cert certification board. Uh, I would say for for this space, uh, you're, you can expect that you're going to need a type certification board. If you're a plain vanilla uh, airplane or rotorcraft uh, uh, helicopter and do an amended type certificate or a supplemental type certificate, you're probably not going to have a board. But I, I would say that the, due to the tremendous interest in these vehicles, you can expect uh, a type certification board. Uh, for these vehicles, and likewise, um, to put it in perspective, you, you'll see a typically a type certi certification board for uh, for um, Part 25 uh, airplanes quite quite often as well because of the criticality uh, and, and you know the um, the the impact and the, the required level of safety for those. So, urban air mobility I know is intended to, for to make the economical uh, the, the economic uh, use case <laughs> work, it needs lots of vehicles. So there's lots of interest. You can probably expect uh, while well, we're paving the path here that you would have type certification board. And you'll have a preliminary type certification board meetings. Uh, these will be formal meetings and, and trying to uh, manage the, 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 this process. Quick note down there in, in these orders, you see a lot of orders that still refer to a directorate. That's one of the things that changed um, coming out of our, our reorganization and the orders have not caught up yet. But uh, the, you can go to 8100.5 Delta, uh, that 
that talks to what the new divisions are, policy and innovation, compliance and airworthiness uh, specifically. And anytime you see directorate, just assume that that directorate means that uh, uh, you're going to have somebody from the policy and innovation division um, and their functional responsibility involved in that portion of the uh, certification process. Talk a little bit about the tools that are used in type certification. Issue papers is uh, is, a, is a common term in the in the FAA. Uh, like all things, we we don't necessarily require that you have issue papers. But the good thing about if you use issue papers to document and bring closure to technical issues, that uh, that gives you that common ground that I talked about before. If you you can reference issue papers into 80, to 8110.112. 8110.112 has lots of school of hard knocks um, written into it and talks to the things you need in an issue paper. Uh, what, if you put those certain things in that issue paper, then that issue paper tends to stand the, the test of time. And not only that, quite a few times the uh, technical issues that are documented in an issue paper find their way into uh, notices of proposed rulemaking or advanced notices of proposed rulemaking or public comment, things that get published in the Federal Register. So if you use the issue paper format, that sets you up. You have the, um, you have the uh, technical verbiage. Uh, if you follow the writing guide, it can just be lifted and put into a Federal Register, and you can, you can uh, track public comments, you can disposition public comments, and bring them back in uh, to your issue paper. And basically, issue papers in general, very general sense, they get opened and they can stay open for a long time. Uh, and when they get closed, it means you've met closure on that technical issue. Some issue papers can stay open for the, uh, for the life of the certification pro uh, um, project. So um, there's a lot of things under, under the issue papers, the uh, certification basis. You'll hear uh, certification basis is a special issue paper called the G1 issue paper. Um, means methods of compliance. You may have a general um, uh, issue paper, a G2, um, but you, that, that covers that, but you may also have uh, individual issue papers that, that talk to, uh, uh, just have discussions around methods of compliance for, for, for your certification. And, and those are captured in, in independent issue papers if it makes sense. But once again, it, it, it allows us back and forth between the applicant and the FAA to resolve issues uh, and, and bring them to closure. Um, special conditions are rulemaking. Um, that's uh, an important point that's uh, called out in part 11 and is referred to in part 21, 2116, I think. Uh, the special conditions are, are, are a special <laughs> form of technical issue. And, and they, um, because when they rise to the level of special condition, because they're rulemaking, there's a, uh, a relatively um, formal path those have to follow to satisfy the Administrative Procedures Act. Uh, so um, that's important. Equivalent levels of safety, uh, not rulemaking, uh, captured in an issue paper uh, and ultimately lead to a uh, equivalent level of safety um, memorandum. And that memorandum has to be publicly noticed. Uh, so it's a uh, it's not rulemaking, but it is it is publicly noticed. And you'll if you go to that rgl.fa.gov that I mentioned earlier, regulatory and guidance library, you can see uh, ELOS is in there as well. I didn't put exemptions on there, but exemptions would also be covered under under an issue paper, uh, perhaps. And and uh, those are uh, essentially uh, they they have the same level as, as as rulemaking, but they're most of the time if you can do an exemption. Due to the requirements of an exemption, you're, you can do an equivalent level of safety, so that's preferred. The issues book is, is uh, the program program or project manager keeps that, and it is just what it says. It's a, it's a book of all the issues, and that can grow quite large on um, very new and novel or, or very uh, high visibility or highly complex uh, aircraft. Um, you've uh, got all of that for, for electric. VTOL. So the issues book becomes very important. The um, and then the project specific certification plan. It, you know, this is um, I can't say this enough, but if you do the work on the certification basis and you do a really good job with the certification basis 
it eases the project specific certification plan because the um, the certification plan starts to make some sense because it's uh, it's built on the foundation of the certification basis. If you get ahead of yourself, which happens sometimes, the uh, the PSCP can can get very um, very confusing because the certification basis, well, the, the the required amount of work in the certification basis, uh, well, was not adequate, and basically the certification basis takes you out of the um, requirements definition phase into the uh, compliance and implementation phase phases. So that's why I spent a little bit of time on the certification basis here. Uh, so the certification basis, uh, it, this comes through the Part 21 regulations it, uh, is your regu regulatory process for anything. You've got a designation of applicable regulations and uh, um, you can read that yourself. Uh, the 2117, but the, the key here is you need applicable regulations. And if you're using one of those regulations, one of those parts, and and uh, uh, and, and it becomes necessary, you, that, that's where you need to bring in special conditions. Here's a special condition process. This is in the uh, type certification order, 8110-4 Charlie. And you can see it truly is a process and it and, and you need to account for the time and put the rigor into this to, to, to do a good job with it. Equivalent level of safety we, we touched on, not rulemaking. Um, exemptions uh, rise to the level of, of rulemaking. And like I said, in practice, they're very rarely granted quite quite frankly, because the um, uh, those two bullets uh, you kind of You've got a burden of proof to show that it benefits the public as a whole to not use a rule, uh, and and um, you've also got to say that the, that not using a rule will not negatively affect the overall safety level. So when you play down that logic path, most of the time that takes you to well, why don't we just say it's equivalent level of safety due to design features uh, available in the aircraft that that effectively hold the level of safety required by the by the uh, governing regulation so it, and they most of the time they end up in ELOSs although you can see some examples of exemptions in RGL but uh, I took a quick look and then I didn't see any newer than 2008 and then so so the certification basis now becomes a regulatory certification uh, certification basis and it rolls up either the applicable requirements of the part that you're certifying under plus any special conditions, ELOS and exemptions, or it simply takes the uh, airworthiness criteria. Uh, I say simply, this is not, this is not a small process, but, or it takes the airworthiness criteria um, that are established for a special class aircraft and it puts them in the, in the um, uh, types, it becomes your certification basis, which has a regulatory um, enforceability. And that enforceability, in essence, um, uh, gives you the ability to, to hang a standard airworthiness certificate on these vehicles. We all love visuals. So here's visuals. I'll let you um, look at this for a minute. But, uh, but this is where you come into the Part 21 process, um, determine what your vehicle is, your category and class. And then uh, you do the the work of determining uh, what's what's the best path to get to a regulatory certification basis. They come out of the same same spot at the bottom here. So once you have a regulatory certification basis, uh, that becomes the foundation to build your your um, your certification program on. So now, um, if you have that, you can move into the type certification process. Uh, you start showing compliance. Uh, touch on a couple things here. There's a whole bunch to talk about. This, uh, um, if that certification basis is is clear, time check. Uh, then you 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 start. Uh, the applicant wants to be the person who is going to show compliance to the regulatory standards built in that type certificate certificate basis. Conformity is important, and in fact, it's something you should think about early uh, because. Uh, Conformity inspections are, are important, not just for the vehicle and uh, to show to fly flight tests with a vehicle that, that conforms to type design, 
but it also, uh, when you've done any kind of uh, test articles, parts assemblies, those all need to, there needs to be um, evidence that, that those vehicles tests were done with uh, conforming um, test articles, parts and assemblies. So it's important to consult manufacturing personnel early, the FAA manufacturing personnel early in the certification project. So to make sure that, uh, that you, can, you can reach that, that burden of proof. Uh, to not do it uh, is okay too, but it, it may result in retests of uh, conforming articles, which can be a, uh, uh, a time and expense burden that you may not have had to. Uh, uh, aircraft Certification Office uh, gets involved. Uh, this says test plan approvals, and test plan approvals are typically done by, by the now by the National Flight Test Group that I'm part of. Um, and but we're when we're doing that, we're supporting the aircraft certification office as as flight test uh, uh, experts, and we'll do the flying um, for the aircraft certification office for the for the flight test. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, the, it looks simple, but basically, the applicant makes a bunch of showings of compliance. In a perfect world, the FAA would come in and do a finding of compliance. So we're saying that, that uh, yes, it does meet the regulatory certification basis requirements. Um, in practice, quite often, the, the there are some areas where, where we do that together with the applicant. Uh, we do concurrent testing and uh, those types of details can, can get uh, built into the product specific certification plan uh, and, and or the, uh, the the flight test plan. You like I said, it, it, we don't do it in a vacuum. It's not all engineering here. You bring in the um, flight standards. The uh, largely uh, you use a aircraft evaluation group and maybe other um, uh, line flight standards individuals. And you see, you're going to do your operations and maintenance evaluations. You're you're going to look through your instructions for continued airworthiness. Um, yeah, function and reliability testing requires on requires uh, uh, that, that you know what the operational use case is. We, we know what that is for flying a three degree glide path to an airport. Um, uh, it may be something completely different for urban air mobility or or uh, urban cargo delivery. Those um, those concepts of operations, operational use case, uh, need to be understood uh, somewhere if we want to do a good job of this. Otherwise, we we end up uh, making uh, poor assumptions, and and so so if we can, I think this is a, a key part for this group is that this industry really needs to uh, coalesce on what uh, this this operational use case is. It'll ultimately help. Uh, it, it's going to give you some standards that, 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 that you'll have to meet, but it'll also help for a common understanding of what we're working towards. So um, that's really important. And flight test does the, uh, with, uh, along with others, that, that does the, the flight manual. There would be a, a um, uh, flight standardization board typically to, to figure out uh, what, what needs to be in the flight manual. And going through all that, you, have, you know, uh, this doesn't happen overnight, obviously. the uh, you would, your goal is to get to a final type certificate board meeting where you can issue the type certificate and the data sheet. And uh, uh, that, that type certificate data sheet, by the way, is part of the, um, the, the certified type design and is, and is legally enforceable. So you saw this one already. I just, uh, um, just want to show this again to, to show you the process for, for certification. Uh, it's the same for validation in in a way, but uh, but in validation, uh, the the um, we're basically looking at a foreign uh, civil aviation authority's certification work, and so it's a it's a much smaller level of effort, uh, particularly if we're harmonized. If we're if we're not harmonized, then that validation work becomes uh, uh, a lot more. That's why that's why it's so important to get this uh, international harmonization. So the compliance phase, um, it's uh, it's not pretty, uh, uh, but the but the, the product, if we do it uh, right, uh, tastes pretty good. The you'll notice there, uh, uh, just as a as a visual, it, we're going to make some revisions to the 
policy standards, um, even the rules. The, the, those things can change while we're going through the compliance phase based on uh, vehicle characteristics, capabilities, uh, new and novel vehicles. With anybody who's been in aviation for long enough knows that you, you know, you never get it right the first time, and, and you may run into roadblocks. You work those through issue papers. You make make revisions, and ultimately you add those to to the public or publicly available stuff. And uh, the goal is to have one of these. And that's a type certificate data sheet, uh, which captures your regulatory cert basis. Uh, and, and basically, you can see here, this is a, this is a really important document. Uh, you, most of the time, these, uh, these documents are uh, reference other things. But they, this is your roll-up. This is your roll-up of all the, all the um, rules, uh, um, uh, guidance, uh, means compliance, all the things that go into your regulatory. Uh, when it gets rolled up into the regulatory cert basis, this now gives the durability and enforceability that's required for the overall FAA mission for uh, safety and efficiency. And as I put there, this is your legal framework for continued operational safety of this aviation product as it goes forward into the uh, post-certification world. So a um, couple of things that, that uh, I hope you take from this, you know, the vehicle provides a cornerstone. Uh, for 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 any kind of evolutions in operational use cases, um, yeah. and if you take the time to come up with an appropriate regulatory cert certification basis, uh, that is uh, is going to end up in your type certificate or data sheet, and that is going to be the um, catalyst for for infrastructure changes, particularly if you want those infrastructure changes to be done with with public monies. Um, I, I'm stepping out of my realm here, but I, I, I truly believe that that's the uh, uh, that's the name of the game here. And you, it doesn't take long. I don't have the charts in this, this slide, but I do have some charts available. Uh, one in in particular uh, shows how things like uh, terminal procedures, uh, obstacle clearance standards. I think some of you have seen those. I think I had them in my uh, uh, early earlier web webinar. The the your certification requirements. If you have an efficient system, the certification requirements for, for the vehicle that, that, that so that design assurance lines up directly with uh, terminal procedure requirements and obstacle clearance requirements. If there's no gap between uh, no extra conservative margins, that that enables the vehicle to not leave performance on the table and allows for for a efficient use of these these new aerospace concepts. So do a good job. With that certification basis, and make sure that it um, uh, uh, tells the world what, what your vehicle is truly capable of and assured to be capable of. So, just uh, um, reasons for saying these type of things. Uh, why do I say the vehicle is foundational? Uh, just look back at history. You know, the Benz motor car. Uh, it, uh, it there were no auto bonds when, when, when that came out. Um, it, uh, so, so the these new concepts find their way, and, and ultimately uh, lead to uh, evolutions in airman standards, infrastructure, and and build operational use cases. So, and it's and what's in a name? It's important that we that we name these things properly, because uh, what what we name them is going to determine, and what their characteristics are is going to determine uh, whether you can relax some of the existing standards. Uh, I, I go down to the third one there, the helicopter there. It was granted relaxed minimum safe altitudes under 91, 119 um, because of the unique characteristics of a helicopter. If we do our job right, then um, this is this is the game. These these new vehicles, we can figure out where, where, where they need to sit in the overall safety continuum. And, and that's a, that's a, a an animation, uh, whether that's where they need to be, higher or lower, uh, that's all being discussed right now, and that's a, that's also a subject of I think of across the across the Atlantic on, on where the level of safety needs to be for these vehicles. So I think with that, uh, Al, I'll, I'll stop. Um, went in a lot of different directions. Uh, any questions? 
Um, yeah. So uh, first off, let me uh, uh, just send a comment. We got a, uh, a comment about uh, collaboration. This is from the uh, Civil Air Authorities in New Zealand. I basically said they have a high degree of collaboration with the FAA and other uh, national aviation associations. Uh, in particular, they're working with the Asian Pacific Reason and ICAO and JARUS. Uh, and of course, JARUS is mostly the unmanned, but they're working with, with people. Um, and he noted that the expansion of the industry is accelerated and broadening at a pace that's making it really challenging to build and maintain these relationships. So it's exploding. Uh, there are pe people are trying, it's exploding. Um, that's about uh, it I have for comments or questions, but feel free everybody to uh, type in your new questions while I ask mine. And uh, to do that, uh, let me go on camera too, and you guys uh, can do the same. So Dave, uh, your, your last remarks there just teed up exactly the question I wanted to ask. So your, your timing is really good on all this. So here it is. Now, you're a, a flight test guy, you're about aircraft certification, and that has certainly been the bulk of, of our conversation today. But there at the end, you talked about, well, you got to know your use case and so forth. And now we're, we get this whole new, what I refer to as this mosh pit of, of a problem. It's not like you're putting conventional airplane in a conventional operating environment, and you already know the rules, and we know what the radios need to look like, and we know everything. And everything is all figured out, including pilot licensing, and you just drop in an airplane and you figure out the, the cert basis, right? So it's all, you know, it's just variations of a theme, all right? And that's what we've had for the last 100 years. It's built, but it's been variations of a theme. So set that aside, and now we got this crazy mosh pit of we don't know how to certify the, the pilots going forward, initially maybe. We don't know what the airspace control is going to look like. We don't know what the vertiports are going to look like. And meanwhile, we're trying to make standards to certify the airplanes. What is there, is there a big picture about how we can get to the point, you know, and, our, and again, our council is concerned about the flight test, but we recognize what we flight test is affected by all of that other stuff. Is there a master plan with the, with the authorities to help us get through this, this float? Yeah, so, I I would say um, master plan, no. Uh, I, 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 have, well, I haven't seen one and I would think that I, I would have. I don't know of a master plan. I do know that um, within FAA, we were given a, a tremendous amount of autonomy to get out there and, and, and work innovation. And there's been a lot of uh, uh, management push and, and uh, to, to, to help us um, not impede innovation. And and uh, and and in fact enable innovation. So so we have a green light to be innovative, which is which is great. Uh, but but uh, uh, master plan, I don't know. There's 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 several several different uh, research projects um, that uh, myself and my colleagues are working, uh, and we come back and and share our information and and, and tie that together. Um, we're we're involved with. Discussions with EASA and other other CAAs were involved with uh, with industry standards groups, uh, so we're involved uh, everywhere. Uh, but it's it, it's a little bit a um, little bit of a, of a disparate issue. But uh, I I don't know of any other way to manage it now, and I'm not in a level to make those decisions either. Now it, it, is it. To your satisfaction, now historically, and there's my dog barking, great. <laughs> um, historically, the FAA silos developed because they could develop. They didn't have to interact because all the rules were understood. Is it to your satisfaction that the different silos are at least talking with each other? Do you, do you think that that's going okay or should we industry push for more of that? I think... Um, or, or or better said, uh, is the national campaign for the UAM assisting in that effort? Yeah. So, so if I'm if I'm putting my um, my national campaign hat on, uh, we're we're taking a attack of of trying to build these um, 
uh, charts and the, the, that, that approach constraints chart is an example. That's, uh, we're looking at that as, as a way to try to um, understand what the vehicle's characteristics are and what, what they want to certify to. Um, and concurrently taking a look at the airspace and what kind of communications uh, you know, process will make all of this work in a dense urban environment. Yeah, so, so 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 with that we we've got several several paths we're on, but I, but I'm not aware of a of a um, an effort to to come up with a with a a total roadmap, and and you know perhaps that's that's a good path, but it's like all things uh, the the grassroots efforts can uh, have freedom to go in different directions, whereas sometimes the top down approaches. Uh, constrained. So I don't know what the right answer is, uh, but at some point, all this needs to be uh, industry needs to come with a with a with a general um, vision of, of what these different operational use cases are. I think. All right. So it's it's getting kicked back to industry because certainly what we've seen is every uh, OEM seems to have their own idea of what the operations are going to look like. There is no coherent force coordinating that and it's not the authorities either from what it sounds like at least not in the u.s there's, there's nobody saying here's how it's going to look like foghorn leghorn i say i say son now sit down i'll tell you how it's going to be we, we don't have that <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, that's true okay and so that's it's important to understand that it's still kind of a free-for-all um in terms of how the operation is going to look and how atc might look so everybody needs to stay active in this and, and get involved in these organizations these industry organizations that are trying to decide that. Okay. Uh, I do have one more question that showed up. Are there any uh, specific eVTOL safety requirements slash regulations, uh, you know, like crash worthiness and so forth? Has any of that come forth yet or in the works? Going back to my original caveat, if it's, uh, if it's not publicly released, uh, then it doesn't exist in, 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 in for this for this brief. Uh, so so I'm not going to touch any any pre-decisional stuff. I do know that those those topics are being discussed and and uh, and I do know that those um, those areas are are being considered. Uh, but I I I don't until it's publicly releasable. I think it uh, it's probably not a, um, a a path we can we can go down here. Unfortunately. Okay. Uh, next question: How is the certification process of the FAA different to that of IASA? <laughs> well, it, in, interestingly enough, um, uh, I'm not an expert on on the IASA process. I know they've uh, uh, from from afar. I can see that they're they're building a a framework to handle these vehicles. Um, I do believe, uh, knowing our process, uh, I believe our process uh, already has a framework to to handle these vehicles um and and so i so i believe that that, that we're they're compatible with, with each other uh, i've seen the the early versions of the, the that have been released by iasa for comment on the special conditions for for, for vtol um i do know that our part 21 process allows us to deal with uh, uh either either special conditions or, or special class either either way gets you to the same answer in, in terms of uh coming up with the appropriate uh, airworthiness requirements and a type certification basis uh, for, for any vehicle. So that they, they, I think their outputs are, are, are the same and, and, uh, and the names are different, but you know, the, the simple game is to come up with uh, a, a set of standards. And I say standards as a small s standards, uh, come up with it with, with a set of standards for a given uh, category and class of vehicle, uh, quite quite frankly, it's that work, regardless of what we call it, um, if it's if it's technical and it's in engineering ease, we can always turn that into legal ease. But 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 I, I think it's a that's what needs to happen is we need that collaboration so we're on the same page with what the what the vehicle part of the equation is, and but we're in the end. And I think IASA and FAA have the same goal. It's uh, ultimately we get judged on the on the operational safety. 
So it's more than just the vehicle. It's the uh, the infrastructure, the environment. Uh, it's everything. And and so uh, here right here, I think we're we're working on the on the on the vehicle side, and we just need to agree on as engineers as to where we think the think the vehicle needs to play into that. But we need knowledge of what the um, what the vehicle what environment the vehicles are, are expected to operate in. Can't hear you, Al. Another quickie question uh, for engines and motors. Uh, will the uh, be certified under part 33? Is there a crystal ball on that? So uh, what's, what's published now, uh, once again, uh, uh, going back to caveat one, I won't mm -hmm. talk to any any any, any pre-decisional um the, the part 23 as written uh gives some, some specifics on on when an engine and propeller can can be certified with an airplane or when it has to be certified uh to part 33 and 35 and that that goes for uh, all the other parts as well that um those requirements are, are are captured, and it depends on the on the category and class of the vehicle. So once again, it's that circular argument. The the category and class of the vehicle is foundational, and uh, and how the vehicle is described and what the vehicle is um, drives whether how how they have to be um, certified. So, so I, I, I hate to sound wishy-washy, and, and it's not my intent to sound wishy-washy, but, but I, I don't know how to speak other than, by, other than to have people read rgl.faa.gov, uh, find out what is. Uh, if there are changes to what, what may be, um, that's rulemaking, public comments. It, it, if we want to make changes to, to what is, um, a method, not the only method, is, is to have industry participate with FAA and, and other foreign CAAs to to bring about um, changes that, that that we can that we can all agree to. Um, I will I will say uh, you know the the special class uh, uh, does specifically say that engines and propellers can be certified with the vehicle. Um, you can uh, there are certain levels of uh, Part 2023. 20, where the engine and propellers can be certified with the vehicle, uh, but for the most part, part 33 and 35 are need to be certified uh, on, on their own. But I do know people are working that, and there's people much more qualified than me to uh, talk to the deta details of that. But uh, but I, I won't I won't enter into predecisional. Okay. Uh, we'll do just a couple more questions here. Uh, next one is. Uh, and this is a, a little bit different, but you might have some insight. Uh, could you describe the interface between the FAA, MCO, and the United States DOD, where a, a civil eVTOL airplane can be developed for military use? And does FAA still provide a TC with DOD assurance thereafter? Ooh. Is that in anybody's radar for, for this kind <laughs> of aircraft? <laughs> yeah. But and the the MCO is a, in my layman's understandings, and there's a, a Jason, one of our one of our colleagues, um, would be the be the expert on this. I don't know the reason, but uh, um, the the MCO, as as I understand it, is basically the military cert office, and it, it attempts to leverage um, civil certification for military capability. I don't know that it goes the goes the other way, um, so. If, uh, if there is a military, uh, I mean, but but clearly military technology finds finds its way into civil certification all, all the time. But I believe the MCO. Um, uh, I hope I don't get this wrong. This is this is uh, not the, the the MCO basically leverages civil certification and and the FAA workforce, so to speak, so that the um, the military can then leverage our civil certification. Uh, process. Not sure I answered that one, Al. Good enough for me. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. And one more question here, and then we'll call it a victory. Uh, for other uh, foreign, quote, other non-conventional DTOL, 
at what point should the FAA be involved? I'm not sure I understand that question. Other con non-conventional detail, at what point should the airplay FAA be involved? I don't know if that- Other non-conventional. So is this, is this going outside of the E slash veto? I'm, perhaps that's what it is. Outside of, uh, yeah, may, maybe it's Bell 609 type of EV tall. I'm not quite sure about that. Sure, that sure. Yeah, so, so this is one of those things, I, uh, and spending a lot of my time in the NASA camp, we talked to advanced air mobility, and I believe there's some general agreement uh, being between FAA and, and NASA as we find our way um, that uh, advanced air mobility can be outside of E and even outside of VTOL. It can be advanced airplanes, it can be advanced rotorcraft, um, and any other types of new operational use cases. So uh, FAA uh, will be interested. FAA is already involved if you want to count our participation with, with NASA. Um, and uh, uh, civil cert really gets important when somebody has enough uh, technical readiness and is ready to come in and do, and do a certification. So um, the first step is to if somebody's working, some something is to probably have a, a an early involvement discussion with the FAA on here's the concept I have, and um, I know we have con we have those conversations all the time with vehicles that may be rotorcraft, uh, may be kind of helicopterish, may be uh, kind of airplaneish, and and we start to take 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 a look at them and and see. Um, what areas do we need to need to focus on? But it takes a while, and there's actually need a fair, fairly decent level of technical readiness level, if you, if you can imagine, before you put in a type certificate application, because it does start a clock. Okay. All righty. Uh, as a as a closing thing, just as an update, again, recognizing your caveat, uh, there was word on the street a couple of weeks ago that these aircraft are going to be uh, listed as powered lift meaning you're going to have to have uh, a power lift rating, which only a few V-22 and Harrier pilots currently have, and they get it converted and so forth. Uh, has there been, do you know of any progress on that or any any news, anything official? I, I know of nothing official. Um, well, I do know of something official, and that's available through rgl.fa.gov, right? That, that, that is that is the, the rules as, as they exist today. Um, and and so so if we go away from those, then that needs to go through um, okay. uh, policy, needs to go through rulemaking, All needs right. to go whatever. That's, that's too early for most of that. Okay. It is. Well, it is. Uh, we we dropped down to uh, just over 100 people. Uh, we we peaked out at 175. It was a I think our biggest uh, event ever. Uh, and it definitely was worth the full two hours. Uh, so much good stuff in here. And this will definitely be a classic. So many people are going are gonna to benefit from sitting down and listening to this. Uh, it's perfect one-on-one -on -one material. Uh, Dave, I got lots of thank yous uh, coming in from comments and so forth. Uh, Great. So uh, once again, on behalf of the, the Flight Test Council and VFS, thank you for your time. And uh, um, this is great stuff. We'll talk to you guys in a couple more weeks. Take care, everybody.